Good afternoon, Hallie. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Richard. How are you? Very good. Very good. I'm so happy to catch you in transit, as we talked about for a minute before we went on uh, on air here, that you are in the on the move today. So thank you for taking the time while you're on the move to to connect with us. Oh, it is my pleasure. And thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Excited to be here. Yeah, I, I'm excited to talk about Pinpoint and I'm excited to talk about you. Um, I love events. I love attending events. <laughs> Um, I, I do a lot of um, uh, volunteering with my alumni association, and a big part of that is to like be a host of events. So they're stressful too, right? But uh, <laughs> but before we jump into all that, though, I, I would love for you to just say hi, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Well, first, I love anyone who says they love events because <laughs> obviously events are really where it's what we do. It's what I love. Yeah. Um, but I'm Hallie Seltzer. Um, my company is Pinpoint Productions, and we specialize in events that really where we find meaning through events. So it's not mm. just events and marketing. It's really right. finding companies who want to do good. Mm. And we are kind of the engine that brings that good to communities. And that's really what we love. You could call us a grassroots events agency. I love that. You could call us a um, cause marketing agency, but that's really what Pinpoint is and does. And I'm a New Yorker, if that okay. helps too. Give you a little, <laughs> well, I'm, a, I'm little a Boston flavor. person, as, as you and okay. I talked a little bit about. So yeah, hopefully so we won't have too we much. Don't, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, we don't need to talk sports, we'll but talk sports. Um, otherwise... Yeah, and uh, or anything else for that matter. We'll, we'll keep the tension to a minimum. It seems like we're both pretty friendly. Fabulous. So I, I love it. Yes. Um, you mentioned <laughs> uh, the impact aspect of this, right? And yeah. you have partnered with some of the most impactful brands, really. Um, but before we get into a little bit of that, can you just talk a little bit about the company's inception? Like, where did, you know, I mean, I'm sure you didn't wake up one morning and be like, uh, you know, this is what I'm going to do today. So talk a little bit about the evolution <laughs> there, Hallie. Sure. Well, yeah. we could like start at the very beginning. Sure. Why not? Let's start at the beginning. <laughs> Let's. I woke up and it was 1985. No. Um. <laughs> so, <laughs> I come from a family of theater folk. Ah, so very cool. at the very very beginning, uh, I grew up with a dad who was a lighting designer ah, and a mother who was super. a stage manager. They both went to school for theater. Theater. Yeah. Theater my, arts. Yeah. Technical yep, production. My yeah. sister. Exactly. My sister and I were very massively into theater yeah. and started singing in the car at a young age and kind of just became obsessed with productions. So I would say really did wake up and say I wanted to be in productions, but didn't really know how to get there. And um, ultimately, I went to school for um, communications and okay. political science in Washington, D.C. Oh, great place uh, to be. Fell, yeah. in, fell in love with really kind of the political apparatus that was mm. in Washington and wasn't mm -hmm. sure whether or not actually I wanted to get into politics. Sure. Um, moved to New York, started working for a public relations agency, um, mm. did a lot of work with them, just kind of bringing campaigns to life uh, through written written language and mm. then uh eventually i wound up moving on to a company called product red okay. product red was a company and is a company that does cause marketing this is bono's inception i don't know if you've yeah, heard of them. yeah That's i know red, yeah. red in parentheses yeah. yes absolutely yeah. um and basically their entire function is to bring private like actual private equity to the global fund it's mm -hmm. the largest kind of amount of private money that's going to the global fund, which um, for Red was to help fight AIDS in Africa. When I was there, they were launching the partnership between Starbucks and Red. Oh, yeah, I and remember that partnership. Had, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. we did a huge Times Square event launch. Mm -hmm. And I came totally to life. You it were was, like, this is me. Yeah. Th this is it. This yeah. is me. I loved everything from having to get there at 4 a.m. and set up the things. <laughs> I liked having to prep our speakers. I liked the countdown clock before broadcast. It just all was of my the, synapses. Yeah, were was firing. it like just the the thrill of it, like the, in, the endorphin aspect of it? Yeah, yeah. Yes, but on top of that, it wasn't just that it was an event. It was that man, this is an event that's really doing really good. Impactful. Yeah. This is absolutely. we're like we're bringing this brand, you know, Starbucks into the world of wow. Now every I think it was. I'd have, you'd have to fact check me on exactly what the sure. partnership was, but it was for every red cup sold, part of that money went to the global fund. So right, yeah, I, I do remember both the beauty of like yeah. having an event, but also having this event that did sure. good. Sure. Um, so I'm sure you know what happened in 2008, mm -hmm. uh, financial crisis hit and yep. um, 
I got laid off and it was the yeah. first time I got laid off from a job yeah. that I really, really loved and started thinking, well, what can I do that right. I can take this kind of brain firing on, you know, all cylinders. And yes. I wondered why not try to do events full yeah. time. Yeah. On my own. Yeah. Well, and not on my own. I just started freelancing. So, oh, you know, okay. started as a, as a production assistant, uh, mm -hmm. at, some, at some of the kind of bigger event agencies in New York. Um, and then kind of worked my way up, had a couple of, uh, differences with a couple of our event agencies, <laughs> uh, solely, solely in that I really wanted to focus more on how do we actually bring a little bit more of a three-dimensional strategy mind to okay. events. Okay. And that was when pinpoint started basically. So, wow. Uh, wow. and what year and was I that? Got, uh, so pinpoint started in 2015. So we okay. are in year nine wow. right now, which wow. is kind of amazing. Congratulations on, yeah, you're rapidly Thank approaching you. 10 years. Okay. So I was going to say amazing that it's been that long, not amazing yeah. that we've lasted, but more amazing yeah. that I can't believe it's been nine years. <laughs> It's flown. And, and is the gap in the event industry that Pinpoint Production aims to fill, you talked for a second about sort of the three, you know, the three dimensional aspect of it, yeah. obviously the social impact piece. Is that, is that the gap that you're aiming to fill within the event planning space today, Hallie, or is it something different? I think that really what Pinpoint is trying to do is show clients that an event agency can be more than just the people who are putting up banners. We can also mm -hmm. be the type of agency who is asking the questions, not just of the brand, mm -hmm. but of the communities where we're hoping to serve. So for mm -hmm. example, if you're doing an event for say, I'll use one of my clients, let's use Google as an example. So Google sure. says they want to share a product. Our company would say, yeah, digital campaign is great. Right. Digital always is great. Yes, having a huge kind of like event where you're inviting lots and lots of people is great. Where Pinpoint comes in is we say, why not bring these to the small communities who actually will be impacted by this? Right. Right. Why why not let's avoid New York solely and let's go right. to Oklahoma. Right. Let's go to where, you know, the communities will actually be using some of these mm -hmm. products and doing more of a grassroots campaign versus kind of a big bang campaign. Um, and then within that, we really aim to say, okay, if we're going to these small communities, we want to go in and leave them kind of better than when we walked in. When you walked in there. Yeah, sure. Um, and a lot of event agencies th do really, really beautiful events. And I have to say a lot of not just my competitors, but the people were inspired by doing incredible, incredible work. Sure. But I don't know that their intention is always to come into a community and leave it better. Right. I think it's that, really about very sa noble... satisfying a client. Yeah, that's an extremely noble vision. One of the things I, I did want to ask you about is, is, you know, this event facilitation for building community. And you kind of mm -hmm. gave a little bit of an example there with Google. Um, but I'd love to hear, you know, you know, just and generally, right, where you've kind of like facilitated community building or kind of drove it to to something better than you left it. Does anything come to mind? Sure. There, Hallie? Yeah, well, I mean, I, let's let's stick with Google because Google.org is one of our, our very favorites who we work with because talk about a philanthropic arm who has a lot that they can do. Yeah. Um, we wound up doing a launch with them with Feeding America. Oh, yeah. Uh, sure. So they committed to 50, donating basically 50 million meals mm. to um, the Feeding America community. Feeding America could then kind of disseminate that to the areas where they thought was most need. Mm -hmm. And they came to us to say, how would you build an announcement for this? Mm. And we, of course, created a couple of opportunities where we would do digital campaigns and right. you know, spread the word via YouTube and some of their big YouTube partners like Mr. Beast. Google yes. him if you haven't right. uh, yeah, seen any of his Beast amazing yeah. videos. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we also thought, why can't we go to these food banks, actually mm -hmm. harness the power of Google volunteers who are mm -hmm. already in the communities and mm -hmm. create both a press announcement where we can kind of talk about the grant, exactly what this grant is going to be used for within these various communities. And it varied yeah. from we were in Oklahoma, um, we went to Mesa, Arizona, we went to Pittsburgh. Yeah. Uh, so like you San said, the flyover, so all... the flyover areas for sure, right? Yeah. 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 And, and really in every kind of part of the country. And we really asked the questions of those food banks of what do they really need? Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, one size fits all model for events a lot of the time where if you're going to sure. give a grant, then everyone gets $5,000, let's right, say. Right, right. It's kind of but, formulaic, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. And we just yeah. said, okay, but the needs in Oklahoma are really different than the, the needs in Mesa, Arizona. Right. Sure. So let's have some really like deeper conversations with the food banks themselves to see mm -hmm. what do they actually need? What do they want? Mm -hmm. So on top of kind of making decisions for our client and saying, I think this money could be used better. Right. We could talk to the food banks and really get them to steer what they needed sure. and not sure. the other way around. And then separately, the volunteers who we activated from the google.org side and Google, it came from a lot of the data centers actually around the country. Oh, that's cool. Because that's where the data centers were located. Yeah, yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. It wound up being like are still volunteers today. Wow. So it's kind of kicked off relationships between our client and yeah. the community, which as you know, kind of then comes back to you know, more brand loyalty and awareness. I was going to so say, really, it's, it's symbiotic. Yeah. You've instilled with them now this sort of like, almost like sustainability aspect of it. Right. Yeah. Yes. Cause that's one of the things I did want to ask you also about too, Hallie, is you have, as you just articulated, you have this like very sort of unique approach to your event design, right. And how they create an impression and, and how they motivate change amongst the people that participate. And you just gave a great example. But how do you scale that? How do you how do you do that at scale when you're trying to have such a high degree of personalization and specific motivation and asking the questions like you asked, like, hey, like food, like instead of us just giving you X, why don't we really why don't we ask you, what do you need? Right. Like, how, how do you scale that? Or maybe maybe scaling it is not as important to you. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious as to your theory on that. Well, I'd say the kind of. I can answer that in a couple of ways, but sure. one of them is on top of just having a team where our values all really align, the people that work for my company, we all have kind of the same goal. Mm. It's for the people who worked at event agencies who kind of want a little bit more, mm. um, who want a little bit more of a social impact, want to kind of leave work saying we did something good. And sure. I think that's, I get to scoop up some pretty good talent that way. Right. right. Um, but separately, we kind of started out as an agency who did the reason why Pinpoint became Pinpoint on top of this need is we had a client who was looking for us to do an event in all 50 states at the same wow. two day period, wow. uh, plus four of our territories, DC, Guam, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands. And that forced us kind of immediately to create a network across yeah, the country yeah, you, where you create, over yeah. time now we have audio and video labor in every single state. We right. have decor vendors in every single state. We have, you know, brand ambassadors all over the country, which number one, eliminates the need for a lot of travel. Mm. Uh, we're also super conscious of our own carbon footprint. That's going to ask about really carbon wasteful. footprint. Yeah, yeah. And we do our best to kind of minimize that by having a network all over the country for anything that you need. Mm. And people that are really trained by us, um, on top of which we have warehouses where we house a lot of our um, set pieces that we reuse. Sure. We try to use only kind of recycled wood, uh, nice. but we have warehouses all over the country. So we have one in Arizona, we have one in Virginia, we have another one out in California. So also okay. if we have to truck anything, we're not trucking things Short, all the way across distances. the country. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. I, so we, I, we take all of that into account. Um, it also helps with scalability, obviously. Yeah, I was just going to say this, this, you just answered my scalability question when you talked about this very organic sort of like um, network that you have built that spans across the entire country now, right? That's Which that's also going back to kind of where I started, right, was a lot of where this came from and the idea of how we could build this was through politics. Right. How do campaigns right. tour the country and how do campaigns right. do it where you're knocking on all these doors? Sure. And we really modeled this system after that. <laughs> uh, one of the things I love most about any event I attend is when they bring in some aspect of the local culture into the event. Like I, I, I've traveled a lot for work throughout my career. And if I go to an event in, let's use Arizona as an example, and they've integrated some of like Arizona, because I don't live in Arizona. I don't know the local, you know, like, so I, I, I appreciate when, when that happens, that there's some aspect of, I just went to an event um, where the where where this event was held there's a very large Cambodian immigrant population and they made sure to integrate into the event Cambodian culture right oh, and can that I was ask, just part go yeah ahead. like what what did they do um they brought in dancers they brought in um singers they you know in, in an effort to kind of showcase like 
that the Cambodian culture is really important to this community and having the event in the, in the same physical proximity of that community felt like an opportunity to showcase the these folks that are living within that community and their and celebrate their culture which was, oh. was really really cool yeah um because yeah, look we could all wonderful. just sat around and like drank wine and like you know ch chit chatted and and had some speeches and and you know i was like they didn't do so that listen there's a time and place for that as well <laughs> right sure yeah absolutely sometimes you you have to have that right i mean but yeah, exactly. uh, but i i appreciated that a lot um you mentioned the carbon footprint for a second there um Hallie, and I do want to talk to you about how you're navigating some challenges associated with both, you know, the, the, the aspect of like, oh, it's so expensive. And, you know, there's and you mentioned some of the work you're doing around, re, you know, using uh, recycled materials and, and all that great stuff. Um, I'm going to ask you about the thing you're probably the most tired about talking about, and that's sort of the recovery from the pandemic, right? And how live events have recovered from the pandemic and all these unprecedented challenges that were associated with that. Um, what, you know, what were your sort of critical strategies for getting through that and 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 moving into your your rebuilding phase? Oh, I could talk a long time sure. about kind of yeah. the, the pandemic and yeah. obviously um live events were and not just live events on our side, but theater and all of the things that we sure. love really came to right. a halt. And um, yeah, we all had to, I think the word that I never want to hear again is pivot, pivot. <laughs> because yeah, pivot was the number of how, well, how are you going to pivot your pivot. company yeah. now that yeah. you can't yeah. do live events. Uh, yeah. live events? And, you know, a lot of the companies in my world went virtual and mm. decided we're going to focus have kind all of stayed our energy. There too, right? Some of them have Definitely. really stayed virtual. I was looking at a particular conference that I didn't even realize was virtual. I was I, I was trying to convince my daughter to attend this conference. And, and then she came back and she's like, you realize this conference is virtual? And I was like, no, I had no idea. Like, I thought it was an in-person thing. And then it became, honestly, no, no, no knock on virtual conferences, but it became much less interesting to me. Like, I wanted her to have an in-person experience, right? Absolutely. I yeah. mean, and here's the thing. I mean, the beautiful thing about virtual events now is the accessibility has really oh, widened. Oh, that's right. Whereas, great. of yeah. course, people who couldn't necessarily go to travel these or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And can mm -hmm. now really see it. But for us, when really what we, we do is go to the smallest communities in America and try to spread mm. a message. Right. We couldn't do any of that. So mm -hmm. ultimately we thought, you know, there's a lot of people, there are a lot of companies and people who are taking a piece of the virtual pie. Sure. What do we actually have already that actually isn't event related? And it really was strategy consulting. Oh, it was okay. Well, we can't necessarily do an event, but why can't we use some of what we know on. Right. You know, Your expertise. Problem yeah. solving. Sure. And, and ideating and turn that more into an event, uh, like really strategy. Right. Um, and I have to say that during the pandemic and the number one thing that got us through it were our partnerships and relationships with clients, mm -hmm. um, which I think is the number one thing that I could credit to the fact that we didn't fold mm. uh, because they trusted us and trusted Pinpoint to say, okay, well, we know that they can't do events right now, but they're saying that they can do strategy campaigning Right. Why don't we give them a shot? Right. And ultimately they did. And but for those relationships, I don't think that we would have gotten the opportunity. And that really got us through it. Did they also come to you and and and, and when they wanted to do virtual events, did they also come to you? And because I mean, like, I know I have friends in the event planning space and it was like, you know, they were like, we just don't know what to do. Right. Um, and and did they come to you and be like, can you just please solve this problem for us? Um, that, that, yeah. I'd say that's yeah. like a lot of what we do in general is someone yeah. who has any kind of problem and they're like, can you fix it? And we right. always figure out a way to do it. And yeah, we had a lot of uh, a lot of people reach out, but more for how do we create more engaging virtual yeah. events? Yeah, yeah. Um, and we definitely, we partnered with a lot of other kind of technical agencies who <clears throat> that's what they do and they were prepared for this. Yeah. I'd say the, the agencies that really were, did, amazingly during the pandemic were the the virtual agencies who already existed yeah. um but yeah we got a lot of those questions on how do we create engaging content and how do we actually physically bring this online can i ask you and i'll give an example uh this sure. was the weirdest virtual event that i did during covid yeah. is i oh, did I uh i did an escape room uh, virtually where the there was a human who was in the room and he had a gopro strapped to his chest and he was your 
hands and eyes and ears and feet. And now you'd, I'd say to him, okay, walk, walk left. Okay. Stop. Okay. Pick that thing up. Okay. Look at, okay. Turn it over. Cause it was like, it was the, it was the most surreal experience. But was it fun? I guess. I mean, it was, it, I actually, honestly, I actually felt bad, like telling this person, like, like what, to, and I know it was, it was like their job and they were probably happy to have a job at that time when their event, when their escape room was closed to the public because of, right. But it was just, it was such an odd experience to like virtually direct a human being to, to do this stuff for me. Right. You know, I think, I think that things got really wild during got the crazy. pandemic. Yeah. We, we yeah. had, we had an event uh, that we were actually invited to where we were like Sims in this virtual world. And as a funny, a funny story, we had basically my team uh, were trying to like network and there were live microphones, right? So your little Sim goes up to a Richard Sim and I say, Hey, Richard, I'm Hallie, but it's a little Sim and right. you're, you're a little, you know, virtual yeah. guy would respond to me. And then someone said, follow me to the beach. Uh, and we're like, oh, I guess okay. there's a beach here. This we like beach. go to this virtual beach, <laughs> hop in this boat with us. We're like, okay. So we hop in the boat. <laughs> And then this attendee tries to drive us off of this cliff, <laughs> this boat cliff. And I was like, how do we get off of this boat How do we boat get off now? this boat? Like, and, I'm kidnapped. Yeah. <laughs> and we got literally, we got virtually kidnapped in an event world. <laughs> so we took like so many screenshots because this was basically an event platform was trying to use event people to poke holes right. in this world. And I was like, yeah. well, the number one thing that I'd say is you know, you can yeah. get kidnapped in this world and we yeah. should probably figure out probably a way figure, to stop wait, that. Not to do that because that's a little unhinged. Yeah, <laughs> it, felt, it felt really un unhinged, but that was like one of the few, but I think like wow. an escape room and, and some yeah. of those it's, I mean, but talk, talk about people really well, trying I mean, to. You know, like, again, we were trying to do team building and we were trying to bring yeah. uh, teams together to do, to rally around things when we had to do it virtually. And, you know, there were opportunities to do you know, you, you can do all those like online games and those types of things. And this was a little bit more unique where it actually, we were actually interacting with another human being, right? But albeit yeah. through a webcam, it was still interacting with another human being. So that's really interesting. I, I could probably ask you like 10 more questions just on that with like how many <laughs> we, people were manning the same person. And yeah, I'm sure oh, you know, it was like, it was like seven of us, or seven of us, which which in and of itself was a challenge because I'd be like, no, 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 please go left. And then the other person's like, no, 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 please go right. Or don't, don't touch that thing. <laughs> This. it was like oh my god yeah it was, it was interesting um <laughs> so we talk about how events will continue to evolve and hopefully they will not evolve more with virtual kidnappings and and, and those types of things but <laughs> fingers uh, crossed you know when you consider there's bound to be continued future global disruptions right we're seeing war on two continents now there's so there's so many things right where do you where do you see sort of the future of live events continuing to evolve Hallie, will it be this virtual live hybriding? I hate their hybrid. You talked about the pivot word is overused. To me, the hybrid word is overused, right? But so sorry that I just used it. But <laughs> but where do you, where do you see sort of the where do you see this going and evolving? I mean, I think that there's actually a lot of exciting things happening within events. I think mm. that we're seeing way more use of AI in constructive ways. Mm. I know AI is a scary yeah. world that scary people world. are not. Yeah. But, but we're actually seeing a lot of really positive things to come from sure. using AI in events. The one thing I will say about living in kind of a the start of a dystopian landscape with lots and lots happening, you know, that are mm. negative mm. is we're seeing clients who really want to bring more positivity positive. into, yeah, sure. into not just the news, but also, mm. you know, kind of with their brand messaging. It's how right. do we kind of take into account what's happening in the world and not minimize what's happening with layoffs and also you right. know, global disruption and right. ongoing, you know, health issues. Mm. How, how do we be a bright spot? Yeah. So I actually I think that. that a lot of, a lot of what we're seeing in companies is we're seeing the events trending up, sure. not less events, actually right. it's more. Um, and solely because I think that the world is in desperate need of some positivity and yeah. and more also like human and physical interaction because the more that you digitize the more that you bring on kind of ai and the idea of quote hybrid events right. the more people are actually desperate to have in person connections in person connections yeah you yeah. you you seem like an extremely positive person and um <laughs> thank you i had uh, someone on the show recently who described themselves as an honest optimist which i appreciated that right because it's like i'm an optimist but i'm honest about it 
right? Yes. Um, so like and, a realist and a realistic optimist. I guess that maybe was what she was trying to convey. Yeah. yeah. Um, but also, you know, you talked about being laid off for the first time and that was kind of a watershed moment for you. And, you know, this is not an easy thing to do. Um, a lot of the women that listen to the show are trying to find their inspiration, their positivity, right? Uh, you talked about your 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 sort of you know personal roots and your family roots around this. Um, were were those people there to rally around you, Hallie, when 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 you started this journey? Uh, you know, and and then let's also kind of add on the the notion of you know the 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 um you know the social norms of women in entrepreneurship. How did how did that you know, how, how has that affected you? I guess I'll start with the first piece, which is to say that one of the things that is hugely important as an entrepreneur in general is building community. Your, your team, um, yeah. That's community your of, yeah. of other founders, first mm -hmm. of all, especially in the world during the um, pandemic. I'd say I leaned really heavy on other event founders because mm -hmm. everyone knew what you were going through. Having people mm -hmm. who really get it. Really empathize. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, and empathize, but also could like, be a part of the brainstorming with you. Sure. Where yeah. else, what else can you do? And it bouncing ideas off of each other. Mm. The building community was in, extraordinarily helpful. In addition to my family, of course, who were nothing but supportive and my sure. partners and my friends. And um, But really, I think it's the network that you build of people mm. who really understand. And it doesn't have to be in your industry, of course, right. but it's people who I think other founders, especially for founders, are incredibly helpful. Yeah, founders helping other founders is always a, is always a, a wonderful thing right for sure and well, like you said because not only is there the empathy but there is the ability to help you strategize too right absolutely and and, and, and the thing about the event the event industry and production agencies in new york is there are many we talked right. about how many podcasts there are and why oh, yeah. it's so important you're doing what you're doing but when you have an entire city of event companies <laughs> we're usually competitors right. right and it is a cutthroat world right. to get yeah. business yeah certainly so what made the pandemic kind of interesting from that perspective is I was talking to maybe six of my competitors. biggest competitors sure. on a bi-weekly basis just to be like, how are you doing? Was that are a little okay? surreal? Uh, it felt pretty surreal, yeah. especially because, I mean, again, most of us are friendly. We've worked together. Sure. We've played sure. kind of in the same sandbox, but sure. for us to be really communicating as frequent as frequently as we sure, were sure, sure was definitely a little surreal, surreal um, sure yeah because the you people... are competing for this you are competing for the pieces yes. of the pie right but we were also all really crossing our fingers to survive through it because mm -hmm. of those companies that we were talking to about three of them never were to return didn't make you know, it so, yeah 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 didn't yeah. make it through so it's also this gratitude to say we're so lucky that we are still here and can we still support each other? And I think that that actually really has kept going even post pandemic as we mm. still keep in touch on LinkedIn and we That's poke cool. each other and say, how's yeah. it going? And, how's it going? Yeah. And I'm sure you, yeah. you see each other around too, right? I mean, yes. I would think, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and in pitch rooms. Yeah. And <laughs> you're coming out, they're coming in. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and New York is one of those weird places where it's so big, but you inevitably always run into somebody, right? It just always happens. Yes. Even though it's yeah, 8 million, our... 8 million people and or however million million people it is now, right? Yeah, and the I, live event production world is pretty small. Pretty, yeah, pretty insular, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, and then let's a little bit about, you know, the 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 expectations as a woman. How, how have you how have you worked through that, um, Pally? Oof. Oof. Um... The production world in general is largely dominated by men. By women. Actually. Oh, by men. No, Sorry. Yeah. By yeah. men, especially yeah. Yeah. we're we're the side of production where we're not planning meetings as much as we're building things and we're gotcha. taking things on the road. And it's it's a fairly masculine world. Mm. Okay. Um, and when I started, um, candidly, I was pretty young. I was 29 when the company started, and I really felt like I had something to prove. I had this chip on my shoulder of like, sure. take me seriously. Yeah, and, but that I'm sure that drove you too. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. nothing drives me more than saying you can't do something, of course, <laughs> right? Um, but as a as a woman, still, I think you have to kind of work almost twice as hard to say. Yeah, the proof, you know, the proof factor. We, right? I have the experience. Trust yeah. me. And, right. The burden of the you know, proof. With, yeah, and when you're working with people all over the country, um, you know that trust doesn't come so easily. So mm. that is something that I've been working really at my entire career. But at this point in my career. 
I'm so inspired to see so many more women mm. joining and being producers. Um, it used to be a world really dominated by men, but I'd say that has changed, I mean, really massively over the nine years that we've been in business. That's great. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really encouraging because I'm sure as, as you can imagine, working with women in events, problem solving is the number one thing that you have to do. And women are just fantastic at it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> They're really good. They're yeah. really good at that, yeah. right? And anticipation. Yeah. That's the one thing I think too, is anticipation, right? Um, and having yeah. that sort of like ability to anticipate what's coming and anticipate needs before they happen. That's, I think, one thing that your gender is just so, uh, you know, equipped at doing. Uh, well, and we, I think the, the thing is, we just have been taught our entire lives to hold a lot of things in our head at the same time. Yeah. And yeah. in events and event production, you really will use that skill every single day. Yeah, no, that's so cool. And, and the problem solving on top of that, right? So yeah, absolutely. exactly. Yeah. Let's talk about the future a little bit more, Hallie. So you are expanding into Europe, right? You're, you've got, so like I said, at the beginning of the, of the top of our time together, you were working with some of the most impactful brands in the world. I mean, just go to your website and you can see the logos and the folks that you're, you're dealing with, right? Talk a little bit about, about your expansion and your future plans for Pinpoint as you hit your 10th anniversary. I know, get a little <laughs> nauseous, 10 years. Um, <laughs> but uh, the real reason for us moving into Europe is we have a lot of clients who are obviously worldwide. Mm -hmm. And as I was talking about impact and carbon footprinting and how do, how can we be more efficient, mm -hmm. having someone who is in the UK, which is where our staff is, made all the sense in the world because we have clients who have offices in London and maybe they want to do an event in Scotland, but they want pinpoint, right? Yeah. Because they know us that yep. we, they want the same strategy minded event company. And we, mm -hmm. you know, that was something that felt really important to us was to move off of our continent was start in Europe. And the hope mm -hmm. is to kind of have at least a couple of people everywhere. We have right. an agency partner who we love in, um, in New Zealand, Ooh. but that's not pinpoint, right? right. That's our agency that's, partner. That's so having more sure. of us, yeah on the ground is, is really part of the expansion and we're excited mm. to be in Europe. Do you um, have a pretty uh, high vetting process for your partners? I imagine you would. Oh, you mean, like, for example, like my partner agency in New yeah, Zealand? Yeah, so, so I have to assume that you're you're highly vetting them before you're deciding to bring them on as a partner. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. We, um, we had the opportunity actually to work with them specifically for an event that we were doing in Wellington. Oh, cool. And- Originally, we hired them to be our kind of, actually, you mentioned it earlier in the podcast was making sure that we were taking in the cultural mm -hmm. relevance. And mm -hmm. they were people who deeply understood Maori culture mm -hmm. and deeply understood how Maori culture would impact events. There's certain things that we had to do to make sure, sure that there were- Be respectful you know, the, the and yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and also making sure that we were following the right rules. Yeah. And uh, we had them as kind of our- our cultural touch point. Mm. Um, and also because, you know, they're so far away, New Zealand right. is extraordinarily far away. They're right. helping us do some venue research. And by the time we got there, we just fell in love with the team. Mm. So we actually, the vetting process was actually through working with them. Yeah. Uh, that was a really, really fortunate um, coincidence where we had, we could actually work with them, see how they did the work on the ground, see how they treated their partners. Mm. And their ethos was really, really similar to ours. The fact that they were so careful about doing exactly what was appropriate, right. right. Really vibed with what you we could wanted. See that. Which yeah. Was, yeah. You're like, yeah. These, this, this jives with us for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And you can, you can tell when you meet other partners who, who really gets it, who's right. really with you. Yeah. And you I would can, imagine you can, you can pretty tell you at this point, your, your intuition is probably really high on that. And you can see immediately that they're of like mind to you. Simpatico. I, I like to think so. Yeah. 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 That's, that's impressive. Yeah. Um, there's a couple questions that we are a little bit of standard that, that we love to get to on, on the show. And as we, uh, get close to wrapping here, I want to let you get back to your busy life. <laughs> um, one is the inevitable question of if I knew now, or if I knew then what I know now, would, would any, is there anything especially kind of meaningful there for you, Hallie, that you would bring forth to an inspiring entrepreneur? Oh my goodness. I have sure a couple so that... many that you can come pull from, right? Yeah. 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 So I think the number one, and maybe I'll lean into the positive energy is sure. celebrate, celebrate wins. 
Mm. There's always so much to do. There's always so much that you have to do when you're a founder of a company, your brain is working nonstop. You're right. dreaming about it. I have a notebook next to my bed when I have an anxiety and I just I do write the it same down. Thing. Just, oh my God. Really? I do the same thing. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yep. Just to yep. get it out of your head. Yep. have to write it down. And yeah. I think yeah. when you're moving so fast, it's hard sometimes to see how far you've come. Mm -hmm. And and I think celebrating even the small wins mm. uh, would w is huge to kind of keeping your own confidence up sure. when it's easy to get yeah. lost. It's hard to it's hard sometimes, right? And and you you get so focused on the negative and mired in the negative and what's not going well, right? Yeah, and I'd say yeah. the second thing, kind of of a similar uh, maybe similar elk is even founders, even entrepreneurs of small businesses deserve breaks. Yeah. And and taking and taking breaks off of work is so yeah. necessary. So you, you don't, don't have to out. work 90 hours a week. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. setting some boundaries. But, you know, yeah. when you're first starting, I had none. I was answering calls at 10 o'clock and I was. Yeah. Yeah, on a Sunday, taking no whatever. Vacations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sacrificing <laughs> all these, could... all your personal life for this. Yeah. 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 And yeah. I think the thing that I would tell myself if I could look back is you wouldn't lose clients by setting boundaries. Right. Yeah. In fact, a lot of them respect you for that, right? If, a if thousand anything. percent. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then as you define success for you personally, Hallie, and success for Pinpoint Productions, are those things mutually exclusive? Oh, mm. maybe it's like a therapy question. Um, yeah, a little bit, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to? You know, I actually, I, I think because so much of Pinpoint is me and so much of me is yeah, Pinpoint. Yeah, it's Pinpoint, yeah. Um, is there I like think a blurring the, or like a, like a, not a, even a blurring, just like a complete integration, right? I think that the number one thing that I see as success is having a happy team. It's mm. having employees who love coming to work. I love who are that feeling answer. inspired. Yeah. Um, and I think I feel that in my personal life too, right? Mm. It's both things is making sure that the people that are in your life are happy and making mm. sure that they feel fulfilled. That really is success. And on top of that, if we can continue to find brands who want to do good sure. and find the right brands who want to spend money towards, you know, actually making an impact. Right. Those are the companies that we really want to be a part of. And we definitely have a short list of those that we'd love to work with. Yeah. And it sounds like they love working with you too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hope so. I like to Yeah, think you like so, to yeah. think so, right? Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for telling us the pinpoint story, for telling us your story. Um, I know I learned a lot because I like I said at the top of this, I love attending events, but I don't know anything about what goes into them. So, <laughs> <laughs> so well, I, we we are here to answer any questions you have, Richard. Anytime. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I love that. Thank you. And 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 again, um, best of luck to you. We're going to keep a close watch on what you folks are doing. And maybe one day I'll be at an event that you produce and wouldn't that be cool? And that would be so Oh my exciting. goodness. I would yeah. love that. Yeah. And uh, thank you again for your time. And we uh, look forward to, to uh, staying in touch. Perfect. And thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You're welcome.